Hello, welcome to this course on polymers. Uh, this is week two, uh, in which we will start learning about single macromolecule. In the past week, uh, we learned uh, basic concepts related to polymers macromolecules. And uh, in this week, we will see that behavior of a single macromolecule or a segment of a macromolecule is very useful in terms of determining properties of various kinds of bulk polymeric systems. So, looking at a single macromolecule will help us understand behavior uh, of a polymer in a solution. Uh, it will help us uh, looking at uh, what happens to macromolecules when a melt is flowing in a mold. Uh, it may help us and how segments of rubber uh, deform. And so, uh, behavior of a single macromolecule uh, is very important in terms of describing various phenomena in polymer science. So, in this week, uh, we will uh, focus on some of the aspects of a uh, single macromolecule. Uh, in the beginning of the course, I uh, mentioned that uh, we will place uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, sustainability of polymeric systems. So, in this week, uh, before going on to single macromolecule, we will spend uh, two, three uh, lectures on uh, looking at uh, some sustainability aspects. And uh, this uh, particular lecture is devoted to uh, renewable uh, resources. So, we are in week two uh, where we will uh, start looking at a single macromolecule in much more detail. To begin with, uh, let us look at uh, renewable sources for polymers and how macromolecules can be made out of renewable so resources. And we will do this uh, by first uh, looking at uh, what are renewable resources, just defining them. And then uh, we will also look at one important uh, uh, set of uh, renewable resources which are used uh, uh, in uh, polymeric systems and those are natural fibers. And uh, then we will end with uh, just a couple of examples from uh, about polymers uh, which have been made from uh, renewable resources or uh, these are polymers which are based on renewable resources. So, what do we mean by renewable resources? So, generally whenever we think of a material, uh, we need to think of what are the raw material or the feedstock for the material. And uh, that is where uh, the uh, concept of renewable resources comes from if the material itself is not renewable. So, a resource or a feedstock is renewable if uh, it can be biologically or naturally uh, refilled. But the question also is uh, related to how much time. Uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, petroleum also comes from biomass. So, in the end, it is also derived from a naturally occurring system, uh, trees and plants and basically biomass. But it takes large amount of time for it to get converted to petroleum and coal. So, here uh, we do talk about uh, duration which is important and uh, which has to be small. So, in small amount of time, uh, if a resource can get renewed uh, due to biological or natural processes, then we will call it renewable. And uh, so, crude oil clearly is a non-renewable resource from the point of view if it takes uh, 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 lots of time for it to get uh, made. And so, generally, uh, for example, we think of petrol and diesel. If, we, if it comes from uh, crude oil, then we say it is a non-renewable uh, source. If uh, the fuel uh, for driving a car or any other transportation vehicle comes from a biomass, uh, for example, alcohol which is produced from biomass, then we will call it renewable. So, in case of polymers, uh, we can have renewable resources in terms of feedstock. We can have polymers uh, themselves also are produced in nature. So, we can think of uh, renewability in terms of feedstocks which are used for making polymers or polymers which are themselves made in nature. So, for example, generally uh, feedstock for polymers, uh, the synthetic polymers that we are so used to in terms of plastics, rubbers and FRP, uh, the general feedstock is hydrocarbons and uh, any other solvents and uh, reagents and uh, uh, co-monomers which are used, uh, they all uh, come from uh, crude oil. And so, uh, polymers are very important example uh, of uh, petrochemicals, chemicals derived from petroleum. And uh, so, uh, these are non-renewable. And uh, just to carry forward uh, with the uh, definition, uh, renewable does not imply all the time biodegradability. 
So depending on, uh, for example, natural rubber uh, is, is uh, produced by trees, but it's not as easily biodegradable. Uh, of course, in all of these things, you have already noticed that I'm talking in terms of qualitative features. And uh, you may ask the question, uh, what is the number? When I say small duration or large duration, small time, large time, what is the duration? And so this is a question which uh, answers are not straightforward. It's clear that petroleum takes so much more time to reform compared to biomass. We, we see crops uh, getting grown every two, three months. Uh, sometimes trees will take uh, 20, 30 years. Very different amount of time compared to petroleum. So therefore, uh, even though I'm not putting a strict number, I hope you get an idea that whenever I say small, most likely it's a uh, duration which is less than tens of years. While uh, when we say very large amount of time, we are talking about thousands and uh, millions of years, lakhs of years and so on. So therefore, there is a clearly distinguishable feature in terms of what is the amount of time. So if, even when we think in terms of biodegradation, uh, if it takes thousands of years for biodegradation, again, it's not of interest from the point of view of new materials which are being brought at a very rapid rate due to our consumption. So clearly, uh, when we think of biodegradation, it has to be achieved within a few years for it to be become a process uh, where we uh, produce these materials, we consume or use these materials, and then they get degraded. All this within a span of tens of years. So therefore, uh, uh, biodegradable is also with uh, this uh, caveat that the amount of time has to be reasonable. So lignin, for example, uh, it's a natural uh, polymer and uh, it's part of wood. And again, it's not something which, uh, in fact, again, biodegrades very easily. In fact, that's the reason that uh, we have uh, some of the lignin stored and we get petroleum. So therefore, some of these are features which we have to always question and uh, think carefully before uh, talking about each of these terms. So let's continue and look at, uh, you know, what are the options? What are the strategies uh, available to us to try to say that, okay, we will start using polymers, which are more and more based on renewable resources. So what can we do? So the first thing, of course, that is easy to do, and that is being done to quite a bit of an extent, is uh, we can uh, do a partial replacement. So instead of using a polyethylene material, we can use a mixture of polyethylene and starch. And up to 30-40% starch can be incorporated in polyethylene. And then you can say that, you know, the amount of plastic waste that I have to deal with is 60%, while the 40% may be accessible. There are issues with this because if starch is embedded in polyethylene, is it as biodegradable as pure starch? So that's something we have to think of. But in general, uh, the idea in this strategy is to say that is to uh, try to use materials which are renewable in combination with synthetic polymers. So uh, you can make starch polyethylene blend. You can also use a composite. So natural fiber composite, which we'll just discuss in this lecture, uh, uh, belong to this class of materials. We could uh, take some of the natural polymers and then modify them for our use. Because a natural polymer may serve a certain purpose in the biological domain. This purpose could be structural or uh, any other uh, mechanical, structural mechanical or any other role. Now, for our purposes, when we want to make an engineering component out of it, uh, the properties may not be exactly the same. So we may have to modify it, uh, sometimes even to process it, because uh, the way nature processes and a tree a trunk is grown, which can withstand a lot of uh, weight, uh, we may not have uh, that capability of producing a column like that. So we will have our techniques of uh, molding and casting and other techniques which we are uh, familiar with in terms of processing of engineering material. So we may have to modify a natural polymer so that we can process it using molding and casting and several other techniques. So therefore, modification of existing natural polymer is another strategy. Moving down, uh, we could, of course, use the natural polymers and composites themselves. So tree trunk, of course, bamboo, uh, there are so many such natural materials which are already used. And in some form, uh, they can be used for certain applications. The other uh, uh, major strategy is to take uh, monomers, which are available from the natural world, 
and uh, then uh, try to polymerize them. So we think of uh, synthesis of these uh, in terms of useful polymers. So right now, a lot of synthesis of polymers happens based on petrochemicals. These are byproducts of petroleum uh, refining. And uh, therefore, since they are available in large quantities, uh, we have over the decades uh, with very clever uh, uh, manipulation of uh, reaction conditions and our understanding of chemistry, we have come up with a large set of family of polymers. Now, can we do the same by saying that, okay, let's look around and see what are the possible monomers available and can we now start synthesizing polymers out of these. We could also go one step and say that, you know, let's start synthesizing some of the monomers. So I realized that uh, a monomer like ethylene is not available, uh, let's say, in nature or because polyethylene is very important. Or for nylon, I need adipic acid and it may not be uh, available as it is. So can I use some of the natural uh, materials which are there? Can I modify them so that they become monomers of my interest? So therefore, synthesis of monomers from uh, some of the naturally available uh, chemicals can also be a possibility. So instead of uh, uh, using monomers, which are currently coming from uh, petroleum feedstock, they would be coming from some other sources. We also uh, can uh, continue on this journey and then say that, you know, let's think of alternate family of polymers and novel sets of polymers. So therefore, uh, can we think in terms of uh, alternate polymers themselves? And so this would imply, of course, that we will replace uh, the uh, feedstock based polymers that are being used. And uh, also they imply that these are going to be novel polymers and they will incorporate uh, monomers they, which are themselves novel. And very importantly, we will need a synthesis strategy. We will need a polymerization strategy to do this. So none of these are uh, easy challenges. And in fact, a lot of effort worldwide is going on in trying to exploit these thought processes in terms of getting polymers as a set of renewable materials as much as possible. Uh, the last thing that uh, we again can keep in mind is what happens when biomass is produced. And biomass, as we have seen, is full of uh, macromolecules. And biomass comes from carbon dioxide and light. So can we also think of chemistries by which we can produce polymers from carbon dioxide as a feedstock? So then like what plants are doing, we can also start uh, making polymers from CO2. So this, uh, again, some of these are uh, very uh, engaging uh, sets of uh, research ideas on which a lot of work is going on. And so let's continue and see what are uh, the first set of options that I talked about in terms of uh, partial replacement. And this is done uh, already to quite a bit of extent. A lot of these products are already available. Many of the things which look like wood but are uh, based on uh, polymer uh, uh, are actually examples of this where a natural fiber has been combined with a polymeric resin or matrix and uh, because of the natural fibers the look uh, of a natural material is there but the binding and uh, the uh, rigidity and the overall properties of the material come from a combination of both natural fiber and the polymeric material and there are several uh, examples of natural fibers which are there uh, uh, jute is a prominent example uh, you can get fibers from bamboo and they can be used. Uh, in India, sisal uh, and choir are also very important examples of fiber. And uh, so some of these uh, are uh, already used in a lot of applications. Uh, we could also have uh, silk or wool, uh, which are also examples of some of these natural fiber. And uh, what I've shown here are, uh, uh, in fact, uh, a set of uh, products which are uh, being developed and are already out there in the market, which are uh, from uh, Jute Industries Research Association, their annual report, I have taken this. And you can see that uh, these are uh, very common polymers, polyethylenes and polypropylenes, but in them, uh, jute fiber has been incorporated. And so we have uh, caps of bottles, uh, we have caps of uh, pens, uh, syringes, a lot of disposable items, right? So in this now, if you replace uh, the, the polymer and have 30, 40, 50 percent of uh, natural fiber, then in the end, uh, from a disposable disposal point of view, 
you only have about uh, 40, 50, 80, 60 percent of material which is uh, non-biodegradable and also is non-renewable source. So one of the questions that you uh, have to think of is uh, we are mixing two sets of materials here. And this is a question which uh, we will uh, keep on coming up with whenever we mix materials such as blends where we mix two polymers or a composite where we mix uh, a filler or a reinforcement along with a polymer. So in this case, jute, which is a cellulosic fiber and it has groups such as carboxylic acid and hydroxyl groups. Now we are mixing this in uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, which has only CH2, CH2, CH, CH3, so hydrocarbon based. What is the nature of interaction between polyethylene molecule and polyethylene molecule or polypropylene molecule and polypropylene molecule and between a cellulose molecule and a cellulose molecule? It's very different, right? Because uh, hydrocarbons will only have van der Waals interactions. While uh, carboxylic acid, hydroxyl, as soon as you mention, immediately it should strike you that hydrogen bonding may be involved. And in other uh, terms also, we can say that one set of uh, molecules are likely to be hydrophilic with carboxylic acid and hydroxyl, while uh, with just hydrocarbons and CH2 and CH3 kind of groups, it's going to be hydrophobic. So when we are mixing these two groups, will they be able to form a good bond at the interface? What is the compatibility? That's the word we use scientifically to try to ask about what is the interaction between two materials when we are adding them together. So therefore, uh, generally we use in practice a lot of compatibilizers. And this is something uh, we will discuss uh, in a lecture uh, uh, much later during the course. So keep this in mind that whenever we are making uh, composites and we are trying to evolve strategies to make our polymeric materials according to our needs, we will need to work on how to put them together. So uh, continuing on, uh, just show you a couple of examples which are from our own work. In uh, one case, uh, we have used uh, uh, thermoset based. So it's a polyester and sisal fiber. And uh, uh, what we did is we made electrical components. These are sockets and uh, wh whenever we have switchboards and uh, even uh, electricity distribution when the board is there in our homes. There are various sockets and uh, things like that. So this is a, a component uh, which can be made where about 30-40% of sisal fiber was used. Another example uh, where uh, this picture shows actually it's a micrograph. So therefore uh, it shows a very fine view of sawdust and sawdust is produced in uh, large quantities in sawmills wherever we are uh, uh, cutting uh, wood for uh, using it. A lot of sawdust is produced. So in this example, uh, polyurethane, which is a adhesive, and it's used in uh, uh, automotive applications and several applications to bond different types of materials. And so uh, in this case, what we uh, developed is a polyurethane sawdust adhesive. So again, we use uh, some amount of uh, renewable uh, material in combination with a synthetic polymer. One other idea that uh, you need to keep in mind is uh, there is a large class of materials which are cellulosic materials and uh, not uh, all cellulosic materials are just directly harvested from biomass. So we have example of uh, rayon fiber. Uh, you can search for it and try to read. It's a, it's a very interesting story of how rayon fiber came about and how it revolutionized many of the aspects of our uh, fabric usage. And so it's a cellulosic fiber, but uh, we manipulate uh, harvested cellulose and get it into a form in from which we can make a fiber. And uh, this is still commonly used and it is still a product which is a commercially viable product. So cellulosic materials are important class of materials which are based on cellulose. Directly as cellulose, like a natural fiber, like jute or sisal can be used, or we can modify uh, the cellulose which is obtained and then use it uh, for other purposes. In terms of uh, uh, cellulose and uh, lignin combination, one other key thing to keep in mind is it's a natural composite. We, we have lignin as a matrix which is surrounding cellulose fibers. So in fact, uh, wood by itself, if you think of, is a composite material. 
and it's a natural composite. So when we uh, start learning about composite materials, we will try to take some uh, uh, understanding away from uh, wood, which is a material which has been around for lots and lots of years. So let's now uh, finish this lecture by looking at a couple of examples of uh, uh, polymers which are based on a renewable resource. So one example uh, which we have already seen are uh, related to natural polymers themselves either cellulose or starch, which can be directly used or they can be used after some amount of modification. Now, uh, we can think of uh, other sets of renewable polymers, which uh, are polymerized from a renewable monomer. So, polylactic acid is a very important example. This has been around for uh, uh, many decades, uh, but in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, it has been uh, cited as one of the uh, examples of a biodegradable polymer, which can be used in packaging and several other applications, where uh, uh, large amount of usage will not lead to uh, the plastic waste uh, handling issues that we generally deal with. Uh, we will also discuss briefly about uh, a polymer which is made by a microorganism. It's a bacterial polymer. And uh, polyhydroxybutyrate again has been known for a long time. And uh, both of these polymers uh, have been known and uh, there are uh, synthetic, synthetic strategies for making both of them and both of them are biodegradable. Both of them have interesting set of properties which are uh, uh, quite close to some of the other polymers that we have. But still there are issues related to the cost of these polymers, uh, their uh, processability, uh, also the properties being exactly the way we want. Uh, because if we are trying to use them, let's say, polyhydroxybutyrate in place of polypropylene. Two, three properties may match, seven, eight properties may match, but there may be one or two properties where polypropylene is better. So then how, so therefore, uh, the applications of these are still in uh, not as large quantities as uh, the promise may be. And so there are still challenges associated with usage of these polymers. Uh, just to think in terms of uh, the uh, distinction between natural and synthetic polymer in the context of uh, renewability, for example, here is a question and of course, this is a simple question all of you will know answer to that uh, which of the following polymers occurs naturally. And uh, just to remind you in this course, we have already discussed Teflon and uh, Perspex uh, in previous set of lectures. In case you have not heard of Bakelite, please go and read about it. Again, this is uh, a historically very important polymer. You would be surprised to know that when uh, Bakelite was uh, uh, discovered and in some of its initial use, it was first marketed as a material which from which arts, art can be made. So generally when we think of sculpture and art, we think of stone and uh, wood carvings and things like that. So, so but some of the initial discovery of uh, polymeric materials uh, led people to think in terms of a set of materials which are so versatile and nice that they can be used for a variety of applications and in this case art as an application. So, of course, uh, this answer is somewhat straightforward, but it uh, keep this in mind that uh, in any of uh, polymer science discussion, we need to continuously think in terms of these uh, sustainability related issues. So, just going on to look at the two examples. Uh, so, polylactic acid uh, is uh, basically a polyester. And uh, we will see that uh, many of the biodegradable polymers are based on this polyester uh, linkage. So, uh, polyester uh, linkage is uh, what is thought is uh, basically enzymes can attack uh, this ester linkage and therefore lead to breakup of a macromolecule. We've already discussed this, that uh, building of macromolecules from polymerization is one important uh, strategy that we need. But if we think in terms of sustainability, we need the reverse strategy of breakdown of macromolecules. So polyester bond is known to be biodegradable using bacteria and enzymes. So therefore, uh, this is something uh, where biodegradation uh, is possible through attack of the ester groups and uh, also uh, hydrolysis is possible. So polylactic acid is uh, made from uh, renewable uh, resources uh, such as sugar and starch, uh, lactic acid and uh, 
it's also uh, converted into lactite and then made into polylactic acid. And in fact, there are multiple options which are available and uh, both of these condensation polymerization, ring opening polymerizations are available commercially. Uh, where uh, in a condensation case, it's uh, a, again a reaction which we are familiar with. For ring opening polymerization, first uh, lactide is made. So polylactic acid, uh, which is uh, this uh, repeating unit is made uh, from uh, lactic acid or it is also made from lactite and uh, lactite is a ring or cyclic compound which has so this is uh, lactite and so this ring has to be open for uh, it to polymerize is as polylactic acid. Lactic acid on the other hand is uh, of course since it's uh, so lactic acid so you can uh, make polylactic acid this way or through ring opening polymerization from lactite. And uh, in all of these cases, uh, removal of water is important. And uh, so uh, another technique which is followed in which case uh, removal of water is uh, implemented using a solution which is azeotropic. Uh, in case you don't know what azeotropic is, please go and look. Uh, azeotropic mixtures are useful in uh, uh, vapor liquid equilibria. Azeotropic distillation is something which is quite common. But uh, this is something very similar uh, exploited here in terms of removal of water. So the application of PLA are uh, plenty. Uh, it's used in uh, packaging, fibers, in several biomedical applications as well as mulch films which are used in agriculture. The other example is uh, polyhydroxybutyrate. Uh, which is uh, a family of polymers and again polyesters as I mentioned and uh, so both of these are biodegradable polymers because of the ester linkages and uh, this is based on uh, uh, bacteria and uh, it is alkaligenous eutrophous bacteria and uh, what's very interesting is uh, PHP is produced and stored by this bacteria like what uh, we do in terms of fat storage. We think of fat as energy storage uh, in case of animals. So something very similar strategy is used. But this polymer can be useful in terms of its properties, uh, which are very closely related to polypropylene. So uh, PHP properties are very close to polypropylene. But one key difference is in terms of strain at failure being very less. So many times uh, we would like these materials to not be brittle and break with very low amount of deformation. And so that's something which is uh, very different in case of PHB as compared to polypropylene. Applications of PHB again are uh, similar in terms of packaging uh, and uh, toys and uh, cutlery and uh, things like that. Again, there are commercially available uh, uh, grades of these materials and uh, some of these materials, both polylactic acid and PHB are used, but because of their cost, the usage is very limited. Uh, in uh, I just mentioned also related to the strain at failure. So in uh, uh, two, three lectures uh, on uh, mechanical properties of polymers, we will spend a lot more time talking about uh, strength, uh, toughness, strain at failure and various other aspects which are related to mechanical properties of polymeric materials. And of course, uh, the, the question uh, that was there, uh, I'm sure all of you know the answer. So maybe in this case, you don't even need to go back and look at what the question was. But uh, I hope this gives you an idea of uh, the uh, challenges associated with making polymers as renewable materials. Thank you.